This is an HP 34401A, a very capable and popular benchtop multimeter. With its 6.5 digit display and 4 wire measurement capability, it has a lot of practical uses. However, what drew me to it was its remote interface connections on the back. Now what's cool about this having an RS-232 or serial interface is that you can grab a USB to serial adapter, plug it in, and use this with your computer. And when it's connected to your computer, you can either use Agilent's BenchView software, or write your own like I have, that allows you to do whatever you want with it. But while that's great and all for serial, that's not what I want to take a look at today. Today, I want to take a look at the other port. This is GPIB or if you're HP, HPIB, or if you want to be totally neutral, IEEE 488. But what is GPIB? GPIB is an 8-bit parallel bus, similar to the port you'd find on the back of a printer. However, unlike Parallel or RS-232, GPIB is designed to be able to let you connect multiple devices to the same cable bus with daisy chain cables and connectors. I previously demonstrated GPIB in my Commodore PET disk drive video. In that, I'd showed the cable for the Commodore PET connecting to both the disk drive and my HP multimeter. And naturally, I got questions from people asking if the Commodore PET could actually use the multimeter. Now the short answer is, yes, it could. The longer answer, though, is yes, but the Commodore PET's really not that great. But I'd also shown this for a reason. This is an HPIB interface module for my HP 86A. Now, HP is who actually originally designed GPIB, which is generally called General Purpose Interface Bus, but HP had called it Hewlett Packard Interface Bus. Like the Commodore PET, the HP 86 uses GPIB for its disk drives, but has a proprietary interface. This is where a distinction is made between the HP 86A and the HP 86B. The HP 86B has a single GPIB interface in the middle of this area right here, which you can connect standard GPIB disk drives to. Even though the HP Series 80's computers are designed with GPIB in mind from the ground up, that subtle distinction means that my HP 86A needs that HPIB interface card. But once the module is installed, my HP 86 becomes fully IEEE 488 compatible, and perfect to use with the 34401A. Now while the 34401A may look out of place with Series 80's components, it wouldn't have been uncommon for this computer to be used with measurement equipment like this. If we take a look at the serial interface manual, we can see some examples of the type of equipment that would have been used with this computer when it was relevant. Now to use this multimeter with the computer, we have to make sure that it's set to GPIB mode, because it can only be used with RS-232 or GPIB independently, and we have to make sure we know what the GPIB address is that we can change in the menus. Once that's done, we can start communicating with it from the computer. Now, in order to know how to use the multimeter with a computer, we don't have to look any further than the original manual. Since this is designed to be a remote-controllable multimeter, it has all of the commands detailed here. Now, the 34401A uses SCPI, or Standard Commands for Programming Instruments, as a communication protocol. That is a standardized protocol for communicating with test equipment like this. Now, if you're working within Hewlett Packard's own line of computers, you aren't even left out to dry this much. If we flip later into the manual, we'll see that this includes directions for using this with HP Basic. Now, keep in mind, this manual was printed in 2000, so they were still supporting HP Basic up to this point. Okay, now we have everything connected and set up, we're ready to start writing the program. So I've connected these two probes to my multimeter through the rear terminals, which you can access by changing this button and I have a 200 ohm resistor connected to them. Now we're going to start out by writing a small basic program to communicate to the multimeter and get a resistance reading. So first I'm going to set auto number mode and now we'll begin the program. So I'm going to set a device ID of 8. The device ID is the actual GPIB bus we are looking on. Now the card I put in there for the HPIB to, that's connected to the multimeter is bus 8. The monitor, two disk drives, and the printer also all count as separate buses, so you need to define which one you're looking at. Next, we're going to have a bus ID value that will be the ID of the multimeter on the GPIB bus. And we can see this by going into the menu on the multimeter and seeing what the address is. And on this one, it is 7. 
Now we're also going to create a real variable that will hold the measurement that we take. It needs to be a real because of the format that the multimeter returns the variable as. Next, we need to create a three digit number that represents the device ID and the bus ID. So we're going to create ID equals, and we're going to do device times 100 plus bus ID. Now we're ready to start communicating with the multimeter. So we're going to do output to the ID device, and we're going to send the command configure resistance. And now we need to set the maximum and minimum for the range that we need to measure. The multimeter has to have a range set when you're measuring through SCPI. Next, we need to have it actually take the measurement. So we'll do output ID read. And now we need to get the reading back from it. We'll do enter ID and then we will do measurement. Now we're telling it we're going to enter the data from ID into measurement. All right, and that's it. That, at that point, we will have successfully read data from the multimeter. So we will want to print it and we'll say this is the resistance and we'll append measurement to that. And we'll end the program, and we're done. Now let's run it. Bam! I have a 200 ohm resistor connected, and we've just verified that. All right, now let's kick this up a notch and do some actual data logging. Now the lighting in this video has been a bit spotty because I haven't had one of my lights in use. Now these are the lights that I built for filming on my desk and to just make it easier to work with stuff. Let me go ahead and deconstruct this a little bit to get to just the part I need to work with. This is a 20 watt LED with an i5 CPU cooling fan attached to the back of it. I've talked about this in previous videos, and I have this ongoing project where I'm building my own filming lights. Now, I've been wanting to try and reduce the fan noise because it causes a lot of problems for me while I'm recording, and initially I thought I was going to be able to constant current control the fan. After some testing, I found that it just makes the fan stall and it doesn't work at all. So I'm going to have to use the PWM pin on the header to actually control the fan. So I'm working on a rudimentary 555 circuit where I use a resistive value to control a PWM's duty cycle. So I could just connect this directly to the header on the fan and set the fan speed with a potentiometer like this and have it be relatively quiet and work out well enough. But that's not clever enough for me. Enter these thermistors. My plan is to use one of these thermistors connected to the heat sink to measure the temperature of the LED. As the resistance of this lowers, I will be able to control the duty cycle of the 555. Now I'm probably going to have to invert the output because the higher the resistance, the more the duty cycle is active, the lower resistance, the less. So I'll have to invert the output for this, and that's not a big deal, just a couple more transistors. So for the test, I've taken the heat sink off of the fan, and I'm going to mount the thermistor to the back of the copper slug in here. I'm going to use some thermal paste to make sure it has a good contact, and then I'm going to insulate it with some electrical tape. Then I'll connect the thermistor's legs to the multimeter and take measurements over a five minute time period while I turn the LED on. I want to see how hot it gets with no airflow, and then see at what point the curve starts to drop off, so I can know what the approximate maximum temperature it's going to achieve is. That'll let me find the most optimal point to have the fan kick in, and allow me to have some silent time when I first turn the LEDs on. It should also eventually find a point of equilibrium where the fans are spinning at the minimum possible RPM to keep the LED cool. After a bit more persuasion, I'm confident I have the uh, thermistor secured to the back of the copper slug now. It, it, the tape method wasn't going to be enough. So um, we can now go through and change how we're going to measure this. So I need to set this to be, uh, let's go with 150,000 ohms. And let's say our minimum is just going to be... 1,000. All right, now we can go through and rerun the program, and we can see we're at 80,000 ohms on the thermistor. 
So, as soon as we connect the LED to that, it will start to heat up. But, I want to track the resistance over time. So I'm going to have to take multiple measurements, store them, and then I'm going to go ahead and plot them. Now, as a way of testing this while I'm developing the software, I've taken the potentiometer from that 555 circuit and I've connected it, and I'll be able to change the value there and get a reading. And that's within mostly the range that the thermistor is, so that should work out pretty well. So I've gotten the first part of the program written, and I'll go ahead and list 10 to 999. So here we're doing the same thing. We're describing the GPIB bus, but we're now also going to set a delay because we need to know how long in between we take measurements needs to be. Then we're going to set how many values we measure, and then I'm going to create an array of reels that holds those. Now, unfortunately, you can't use a variable to set that, so you have to statically set it there and there. Next, I create a dim for the configuration we're going to use. Make that easier to change later when we modify the program. And I output that configuration to the multimeter right there. Next, I'll list 1,000 to 999,000, whatever. And here we have a loop that goes through and pulls the multimeter for readings. So we go from counter 0 to values minus 1, because we don't want to go out of bounds of the array. We go through, we get a reading, we enter the reading into the measurements array. Then we print the measurements array. We wait the delay times 1,000, because the delay value is in milliseconds for wait. And then we go to the next counter. And if we run that, I can change the potentiometer value as it goes along, and we can see it drop. So, that's the first half of the program. I can now set a delay, take some readings, and have it change over time. The next part is I'm going to incorporate this into the graphing features of this computer. All right, I've just finished the plotting code, so let's take a look at the changes. So the beginning hasn't really changed too much. Um, I've modified my delay and values variables so I can have some more stuff. Um, now I'm going to show the graph setup portion, which needed to be first, so I've changed the order of some of the stuff. So I'm setting up the graph. I'm using all of the available memory for the graph that I'll be plotting onto the screen. I'm setting the graph space on the screen. I'm setting the scale for the values I need to measure. I'm telling it to not have any decimal points on the scale values. I'm setting at what point to leave marks on the grid. I'm drawing a frame and moving the cursor to the beginning. And finally, the portion that is mostly the same as last time, but instead of printing, we're plotting and we're using the counter as a time variable to do the graph. So if I run this, now I'm just going to do 12 seconds of graphs. It's divided by six for minutes and assuming a 10 second interval. So when I show this the next time, it'll that'll mean minutes. Now I have the potentiometer still connected, which will be zero to 50,000. And I can increase the resistance and the graph changes accordingly. All right, so that is the graph for how I will display the changes to the thermistor. So I think I'm ready to set up for this test and uh, yeah, let's see how that goes. All right, now before I start the test, I just need to make some changes here. I'm going to need a delay of 10 seconds and I'm going to be recording 30 total values. So, now I'm going to hit run. And as soon as the graph is done drawing, I will uh, turn on the light. All right, it's done, but I'm not convinced that was actually enough time, so I'm going to rerun it and let it continue from there.
All right, well, I think that's enough information. So between the two graphs, I can start to get a grasp of when I should have the fan start and at what point it should be at maximum RPM. So at around 60,000, based on the first graph, I think that would be a good point for it to start kicking in. It's still accelerating a lot, but it is starting to slow down just a little bit. And clearly around 20,000, it really starts to peter out, so that should be the point at which it's at full tilt. So in between those two points, that with the PWM automatically creating a feedback loop, it should find a good equilibrium point automatically every time. Now one good reason to have a feedback loop like this, instead of just a potentiometer that I adjust, is that if I ever take these lights somewhere else with a different ambient temperature, this will automatically compensate for that ambient temperature and the lights will stay the correct temperature. Well, I think that's about it for showing you how you can use a vintage computer in the way that it's meant to be used to achieve real work. This is what people would have done back then to do this kind of thing. Now, I'll admit, nowadays I could use my Fluke 287 and measure something and chart that, boom, done. I don't need a computer, it's really easy. But that's not fun. So, so I chose to use my HP 86 for this. Now, this can be taken a step further. You can save the data to a floppy disk. You can even save the graph itself as an image and then bring that back up. So let's say your company is fully invested in the Series 80's computers. So you can have your workstation computer where you did data collection like this, save the image of the graph to a disk, put some little descriptions on there of what's going on, pull out your disk, take it into the conference room, put it into their computer's drive, load it up, and then show that off in your presentation. So it's just a whole nother world of cool stuff. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this look at data logging from 1982, and I'll see you later.